entered into them. And <laughs> newer versions even have fingerprint scanners. <laughs> but But of course, the software would never lie about the results of elections or store the vote and the voter in the same database. And since it prints out hashes of all the program files on the sort of MS-DOS-like box, it could never be manipulated. Brazil has perfectly secure electronic voting machines until we get our hands on them. After Brazil, I was home for a week again and then traveled to India for two weeks. This time, we were there to help solve the problem instead of merely pointing it out. Alex Haldeman and myself were invited to a conference on voting, but as we arrived, we were detained for a night and half a day at the airport because we had apparently, quote, violated the terms of our visa the last time we had traveled to India. India's main intelligence agency had somehow investigated us as part of an international conspiracy to destabilize the state of India. <laughs> we were eventually released after lots of phone calls and lots of ministries were involved. The home minister was woken up. Uh, uh, all sorts of things happened. And, from, and we had to promise that we would not attend this conference, which was a relatively sort of obscure academic conference. Um, from a PR standpoint, that whole thing didn't really work. Um, because we were now regular tourists, except CNN was waiting for us at the exit of the airport. <laughs> but meanwhile, India still has a very serious problem that needs fixing urgently. Uh, India is the type of country that could easily slip into serious violence if there's too much doubt in election outcomes. So this is definitely a story that's to be continued. And there's a funny side note. Just two weeks ago, India and Brazil signed an agreement, a sort of a very bland uh, agreement that has very few details, but they uh, uh, involve working together on unspecified matters involving election organization. Um, WikiLeaks is a bigger issue that deserves a little bit more talking about. I helped WikiLeaks release the video. After that, I needed to get back to my e-voting related work, but I could have stuck around helping WikiLeaks do all these other things that they ended up doing. Uh, they could probably have used me uh, releasing all these other things. Um, that did not happen. And I guess I could make up all sorts of stories about how I disagreed with people or with decisions. But the truth is that in the period that I helped out, the possible ramifications of WikiLeaks managed to scare the bejesus out of me. Uh, courage is contagious, they say. Well, my ass. Um, <laughs> I wish Julian and his people well, but I can't live a life out of a backpack on the run, not to mention that Julian has better and does much better on bites. <laughs> so what are we to make of WikiLeaks? It's clear that recent events will impact the world and our corner of it for some time to come. But it's really early to tell how, as things are still going on. WikiLeaks could well come out victorious in a new generational conflict mentioned in the same line with the suffragettes and the Vietnam protesters. But as it stands today, my friend Julian is potentially facing prison time or even assassination for what essentially amounts to practicing journalism. At the same time, many people friendly to the ideas behind WikiLeaks are beginning to wonder what has been unleashed. Some of my friends have said Julian has angered the gods. Bruce Sterling recently accused him of weeing all over the third rail. And a good friend of mine said that Julian was committing suicide by cop, even. Whatever, whatever we make of it, Present anger and fear at governments over, uh, over WikiLeaks will probably up the pressure to curb internet freedoms. Whether connected to WikiLeaks or not, Crypto Wars 2.0 has recently been announced. There's a new American proposal to make all providers of any kind of online service provide the authorities with clear text of everything that happens. As a result of WikiLeaks, authorities the world over will probably at least try even harder to clamp down on internet freedom. So organizations resisting this will have to work harder also. But we, regarding WikiLeaks, we also need to calm down a bit. There's obviously some very th big things going on here, and we need to keep watching them intently. But just because we like or share some of the principles at stake here doesn't mean our community is all of a sudden drawn into this all-out war 
with a ridiculously well-armed superpower or anybody else. Whatever our role is, it's certainly not to deny freedom of speech to people or organizations who don't like freedom of speech. This whole anonymous thing is so getting on my nerves. Uh, people ask me, anonymous, that's like the hacker community striking back, right? Um, and then I have to explain that unlike anonymous, people in this community would probably not issue press releases with our real names in the PDF metadata. Um, <laughs> And that if this community were to get involved, the targets would probably be offline a little more often. Uh, this is a mental maturity issue. Our community has generally succeeded in giving black belts in computer security karate only to people that have proven a certain level of mental maturity. Yes, some of us could probably do some real damage to PayPal or to MasterCard, but then we also understand that no good comes from that. In the unlikely event, by the way, that anybody here has not reached this level of maturity, uh, please do not connect your machine to the network. Talk to a lot of other people. Get some additional perspectives, because it's the way to go. Um, on the positive side, some of the things about that are dear to our hearts are going to get a lot of attention. And this attention can be used for good if we keep our, keep our wits about us. And finally, on the WikiLeaks issue, I now have cell phone coverage in my office in the basement, which I didn't have before. Yay. Now let's, let's take a wider look at today. As we enter uncharted terrain, we are the first generation in a long time to see our leaders in a state of more or less complete helplessness. Most of today's politicians realize that nobody in their ministry or any of their expensive consultants can tell them what the fuck's going on anymore. <laughs> they have a steering wheel in their hands, but they don't really know what it's connected to, if anything. Meanwhile, the brakes are obviously out and the windy road at the bottom of the hill is approaching rapidly. Politics is becoming more and more the act of looking at least slightly relaxed while silently praying that the accident will happen sometime after your term is up. <laughs> now, that's not completely fair. The fact that politicians are generally helpless in terms of public policy doesn't mean that to say that I think they're stupid. They do have a vague sense of what might be coming, and they're acting accordingly. To judge their efficiently, take a good look at the remaining public funds and the remaining public infrastructure and see who owns it in five years' time. Our leaders are reassuring us that this ship will sur certainly survive the coming storm. Oh, yeah, no problem. But on closer inspection, they're either quietly pocketing the silverware or discreetly making their way to the lifeboats. Even politicians that are the exception, the ones that get it, that want to help, help get us out of this mess, are increasingly indistinguishable from ones that, jo that just pretend. We'll have to learn to navigate a world in which every imaginable aspect of being genuine or sincere has 10,000 spin doctors working on how to transplant that precise thing to the fake turds that run things. Now, this all sounds really smug, like we, the hackers, the geeks, somehow have all the answers. We do not. But we do have some important parts. For one, we understand the extent to which complexity can be our enemy. We've all written stuff that got out of control. We've optimized our privatized world of today to get that last 2% of profitability. And we're already in a situation where everything we need comes just in time from China, assuming that we'll need exactly the same things overall as we needed a year ago. Everything is interconnected, and if one thing fails, the whole system goes down. Winter chaos that's been out recently, just another sign of slack that's in our current society. We also look at many of the In that context, we can all see that our narrative is gaining importance. At the same time, Apple, Google, Facebook, and the more geographically challenged traditional governments will try to make all of humanity will try to make all of humanity enter their remaining secrets. They'll try to make attribution of every bit on the internet a part of the switch to IPv6 at the latest. They'll further lock us out of our own hardware, and they'll eventually attempt to kill privacy and anonymity altogether. We still have to tell most people out there 
But privacy is not, in fact, brought about by some magic combination of the intentionally confusing privacy radio button page on Facebook. It does come from, among other things, code from some of us have written and code that some of us still need to write. We need many things by yesterday. And we need to properly security audit the tools we build, even if that means we can't put in new features just as quickly. Now we'll look at the future. Uh, the future is always hardest to predict. Um, I stand by our basic story of we lost the war. It's going to be a mess. I've just calmed down a lot when I decided for myself that this is not necessarily bad news, all of it. Let's face it, the current situation wasn't sustainable anyway. And people, both in rich and in poor countries, are not very happy now. Some may be rich, but we're not happy. Remember the massive loads of antidepressants we're taking to keep us going. The decline of the Roman Empire was probably a very interesting period to live in, and for most inhabitants, life just went on, with or without Rome. Okay, so the world is going to be a mess for a little bit. You may be asking yourself, what do I do with this knowledge? First of all, John Stewart had it nailed when he said recently at this, this event he organized, we live in difficult times, we do not live in end times. The future is not about finding solitude on a farm on a hill, guns, ammunition, but it is about having working trust relationships with the most varied group of people you can find. It's about imagining beyond today and picking up a wide range of skills if you can. It's positioning your such that you have flexibility. Even if everything stays there, there's not much in any of this. If, on the other hand, some of the structures around us indeed implode over the next decade or two, we as a community will become no less important. Again, the world is not going to end. I promise there will be no zombies and humanity will survive. A lot of structures will survive. It's just going to be quite messy for a little bit. Uh, lots of people will freak out. For us, we won't freak out so much because the news sites will just look more like Fafa's blog and TV news will be more like the Floor Show. <laughs> if the shit hits the fan, a lot of things are going to be decentralized, but still in a very networked world. Some of us will likely be reverse engineering and then re-engineering systems to get rid of some of the crazy complexity and dependencies. Improvising and doing more with less is something we are good at. Not, not to mention making things when we need them and repairing them instead of throwing them away. We come in peace. We're not called the Chaos Computer Club because we, fa we cause chaos. If anything, a lot of our collective work has actually prevented chaos by pointing out that maybe we should lay some decent virtual foundations before we build any more virtual skyscrapers. Vau Holland explained the name to me many, many years ago. I don't even know exactly when. Uh, he's, he felt that there was universal validity in a set of then rather new theories explaining very complex systems and complex behavior from random events and a very few simple rules. And it helped him explain a lot of how the world worked and how one could navigate a future that looked like Shockwave Rider. We may not cause chaos, but we do understand some small part of how chaos works. And we have been able to help others deal with it better. As this world becomes more chaotic and ad hoc, we can help. Now this is the 27th Congress. I know 27 is not a nice round number where you have forced to look back like 23 or 42. But since, <laughs> but since I'm 42 years old this year, I get to take a little helicopter view. Um, I think we should all be proud of what's been created here. There's this video of the 24th Congress made by Kirin Schäublein and others, and I can show that video to a wide variety of people. And they generally first say, wow. And then they go, when's the next one? And that sums up the importance of Dent. It has drawn countless people into community, many of whom did printer drivers. They were freebie currenters or list programmers. But they are now as much a part of this community as anyone else. More than anything, this rather impressive gathering is what we use to show off how many sides there are to hacking. We may have been involved in some kind of hacking before we got here, but this Congress, more than any place else, 
is where it all comes together. This is where we decided that this is all so interesting and so 